Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. Downtown Winnipeg is set to see a big change coming in the next few years. Today, Manitoba Premier Wab Canoe announced plans for revitalizing the heart of Winnipeg. A shopping mall will be redeveloped into a health care center and affordable housing project. Initiatives in healthcare Manitoba will partner with True North Manitoba Real Estate Jewish Development on the Health Center. Awesome. It's been dubbed the Health Care Center of Excellence. The 300,000 square foot 12 story building will house services for primary care and addictions treatment. Construction is expected to begin next year and be completed in 2028. The Southern Chiefs organization and True North also signed a letter of intent to share ownership of a 15-story multifamily tower containing rental units. It will be next to the health center and 40% of the over 200 suites will be affordable housing. Manitoba intends to lease the health care center for 35 years. I'm very proud to be here today to talk about the health care center of excellence that is going to bring together the private sector, indigenous governments, health care, tackling the homelessness issues downtown to deliver a downtown that Winnipeg and Manitoba can be proud of. This is part of shepherding the investments that people have made over the years. And so what's our government doing? We're bringing forward the political capital to unlock the financial capital so that we can build back the social capital in downtown Winnipeg and make all Manitobans proud of it. Chinook salmon are greatly treasured by indigenous peoples in Alaska and the Yukon. Now the U.S. and Canada have signed a new agreement to help rebuild falling Chinook salmon stocks. Sarah Connors explains why First Nations in the Yukon are celebrating the deal. Years ago, Chinook salmon were once plentiful in the Yukon River. It runs through Alaska and the Yukon and has been a source of nourishment for Indigenous people on both sides of the border for millennia. But in recent years, Chinook have been in decline. That's why on Monday, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game and Fisheries and Oceans Canada signed a new Chinook Salmon Management Agreement. I think that uh, it's a great agreement. I think that it's been long waited for. It's monumental. The new agreement places a moratorium on fishing for Yukon River Chinook for seven years, one full life cycle of a Chinook salmon. Little Salmon Carmack's First Nation is celebrating what will be greater protections for the beloved fish. For years, Yukon First Nations have been pushing for stricter measures to protect dwindling salmon stocks. We know that when something's depleting or going extinct, we leave it alone. We let it be, and so that's what we're doing right now. We're leaving it alone and giving it the opportunity to repopulate. First Nations in the territory have largely chosen to refrain from harvesting so stocks can rebound. While the agreement will have little impact for First Nations who already have restrictions in place, advocates say it's a critical step in protecting the salmon. I think that's been the rallying cry of the Yukon First Nations. We've got to put salmon first. That means put salmon above our own needs and that's the only way we're going to save them. The agreement does allow for some limited harvesting opportunities. It will also have a focus on research and reducing bycatch where fisheries unintentionally catch other fish species. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. The James Smith Cree Nation was in the news this past February when a public inquest looked into the death of Miles Sanderson the man responsible for 11 deaths in the nation and nearby village. Now, after nearly 16 years, James Smith has a new chief. With 208 votes, Kirby Constant topped the ballot. In a social media post, Constant said his commitment to his community is unwavering, and he aims to lead with integrity, inclusivity, and professionalism to ensure no one is left behind. Wally Burns was the runner-up with 155 votes. Constant will officially be sworn in on April 12th. It's been praised as a historic win for vulnerable children. A $530 million settlement agreed to in principle by the Manitoba government 
We'll see the province compensate an estimated 30,000 people uh, who were provincially f in provincially funded care between 2005 and 2019. During that time, the Manitoba government required CFS agencies to remit over $300 million intended for the care, education, and advancement of children in care back to Manitoba's general revenue. Former CEO of Southern First Nations Child and Family Services Authority, Elsie Flett, is a representative plaintiff, and she joins us now. Elsie, thanks so much for being with us here today. Uh, can you tell us more about why the Manitoba government was requiring CFS agencies to hold the money back from Kids in Care and how that came about? Okay, I'm not sure why they did that. Um, it start, they started doing that with the First Nations agencies in 2005. Um, the practice of holding back the child tax benefit money or what we call children's special allowance actually began in the early 90s, 92, 93. Um, it was after we finished the AJI process and we had these large numbers of children transfer specifically or particularly from Winnipeg CFS. Um, that the province changed their policy and asked the First Nations agencies also to remit um, the children's special allowance. The reason for that, we were told, was because they were now losing the revenue from these children that they had collected their children's special allowance when they were in care with the non-Indigenous agencies. And so it was a revenue loss for the province, which is why they changed the policy and then asked that the um, First Nations agencies also remit. Um, and this is for provincially funded children. And of course, the Métis agencies, they, they, they were established as um, an outcome of the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry. So they almost like from the beginning had to remit that, that the Children's Special Allowance as well. Now, the practice was deemed by the Court of King's Bench as a breach of the children's charter rights to be free from discrimination. Can you share more on how this has impacted children in care? Well, it, it particularly impact, like it impacts the group of kids that are funded by the province. And the First Nations agencies have two funders for children in care. Uh, they determine whether it's the, feds, the federal government who funds or the province on a residency statement that is taken. So the federally funded children have been able to retain their children's special allowance all the time. Like the, the feds have never made a move to claw it back. Um, the money is intended to provide extras for kids that that is not covered under the regular maintenance that children in care get. Um, and it would just pay for things like, um, you know, if a child's particularly gifted in sports um, or wanting powwow lessons or someone wanting to establish a registered education savings plan for them, those kind of extra things that would not normally be funded for those children, the Children's Special Allowance is a source of funds for that. So $530 million is uh, what's been agreed on in principle here. Do we know how many people are affected and how much money the affected children might expect to receive? We don't right now. The, the settlement is made up of the principal amount, which is the actual dollars that were taken um, by the province. And then there is the cost of living or adjustment interest adjustment on that and then as well as what we call the charter damages we, we've been calling it a resolution fund but really it's to compensate the kids for the damages we're not sure um, how many children are involved it goes it would cover the time period between 2005 and 2019 we estimate somewhere between maybe 15,000 to 20,000 children that would have been in and out of care during that period of time the amount there each child will get will be prorated because children are in care for different periods of time. So there may be children who have now aged out and who were in care for that full period of time and others who might have been in care for six months or a year and then returned home. So the, the payments will be prorated based on the day's care of each child. Now, if I remember from uh, what the lawyers were saying on the day this was announced, uh, you know, somebody who was could have been in care the whole time, it, it could be like $80,000. Is that uh, correct? Well, it could be significant because uh, that time period, I believe the lawyers have, have quoted that to be 144 months. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at the children's special allowance, which is, you know, between 500 and 600 a month, um, so that could add up to well over $100,000 for some children. And then when you add in the interest as well as the, the damage portion. So yes, for some children, it could be significant. 
Now, uh, distribution plans in the works. I believe uh, you were hoping everything uh, in place by the fall or so. Um, uh, what can you tell us about that and how difficult it might be to, to track down some of these people? Well, first of all, with the distribution, we are working right now on the distribution plan as well as a communication plan. Uh, we're going to be, a, we're working on setting up a website. So there's a place where people can get current information and reaching out to anybody who might be in that class. We know that um, the agencies themselves would have quite a bit of information because they would have been billing the province for the maintenance of those children. So there would be records both with at the agency as well as the province. Um, but it's possible that if a child is missed or some agency doesn't have a record going back to 2005. So we are also going to be doing, you know, as, as widespread a communication strategy as we can to make sure that every person who's eligible and in that class is aware of it. Elsie, we'll leave it there. Appreciate you laying out some more of the details on all of this for us. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. We're always interested in hearing what you have to say about anything you see here or something you'd like to see here. Here's how to continue the conversation. If you have a story you want to share, you can send us an email to news at aptn.ca. To read and watch our stories, you can go to our website, and that's aptnnews.ca. You can also find us online on your favorite social media sites, including TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn, and X. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. Time to step aside for a quick break. Still to come, we'll hear from an Inu astronomer about the upcoming total solar eclipse. You know, when Skabesh uh, snared uh, the sun, so that's um, well, that's a reference of some people uh, relating to um, the eclipse.
Welcome back. Well, as you've obviously been hearing, the first total solar eclipse in over 50 years will take place on Monday. And as anticipation grows, APTN's Maricela Amador spoke to an Inu astronomer about the meaning of this incredible phenomenon. Oh my God, we're getting close. It's getting close. Don't fill the door. Excitement for the eclipse is reaching its peak ahead of Monday's once-in-a-lifetime event. Inu astronomer Laurie Rousseau-Nipton has never witnessed a total solar eclipse. She believes it will be beyond her wildest dreams. For the majority of people, when there is an eclipse, the total of the sun that happens in the sky is excessively strange and beautiful at the same time. It's a bit like inexplicable. It's not a day ordinary day. Rousseau-Nipton explained that a total solar eclipse happens at a particular time when the moon passes between the sun and the earth. As the moon blocks the sun's light, it casts a shadow on part of the earth. A total solar eclipse is rare. So, regardez un œil sur votre environnement, sur ce qui se passe autour de vous. Il va se mettre à faire plus froid, plus sombre. On va voir ces ombres là. On va voir la couronne solaire. Et puis, ça va durer quelques minutes avant qu'on puisse voir le petit diamant, le moment où encore une fois la lumière du soleil peut percer et va 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 se rendre jusqu'à nous. Et là, on revient aux lunettes. According to some experts, First Nations culture and traditions are deeply rooted in the stars. So it is no surprise that legends about solar eclipses have been passed down through the generations. There is a Cree legend. Uh, um, we have a character. Um, um, his name was uh, Chikabesh. And Chikabesh is a legend that is, um, is uh, widely known in, uh, within First Nations, the Crees, uh, um, west of us, uh, the Inu, uh, east of us. Have uh, have this, have similar stories or identical stories of of Chikabish. Jamie and, Moses uh, is from the Cree community is, of East uh, Maine, about uh, 1,200 kilometers north of Montreal. Uh, he said that it was his grandfather that first told him the story of how Chikabish, a folk hero, once snared the sun. Could have been the eclipse at that time, when when um, no, when Chikabish, uh, snared uh, the sun. So that's um, well, that's a reference of some people uh, relating to. Um, the eclipse um, of having uh, middle of the day, having a, a, a nighttime and middle of the day. Moses added that he hopes for clear skies in East Maine on Monday. It's a bit a moment unique. It's a moment that we live in community. It's something that we want to be able to observe and to be able to observe together. After Monday, the next time a total solar eclipse will pass over Quebec won't be until the year 2106. Maricela Amador, APTN National News, Montreal. Cool stuff. Well, now to another cool story. The 59th annual Tunic Time Spring Festival is on in the Calouit. Residents have a full week of fun to look forward to. Ice golf is always up to par on the first day of Tunic Time. Competitions in igloo building, outdoor tea and bannock making, shooting and sled dog racing are all on the itinerary. Then there's the famous Akalawit to Kumarit uh, snowmobile race. It's over 200 kilometers back and forth on the sea ice. That's scheduled for the final day of festivities on April 14th. Here's a snippet from last night's opening performances. golfing. It's been a huge year for Indigenous filmmakers in Australia. That story and more coming up after the break.
Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. From Ebb and Flow, Lucille Paul shared this beauty of a sunrise that she photographed just this morning as temperatures across the province begin to rise. Thanks, Lucille. Be sure to send any pictures you would like to share to share at aptn.ca to be our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at Saturday's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, four with snow in Fredericton, five in Fleury's and Halifax. Minus two in Kujuac, plus one in Cloudy in Nain. Cloudy and five for Montreal, eight in Val d'Or. Sun's out and seven for Sault Ste. Marie, plus three in North Bay. A sunny high of seven in Thunder Bay, 10 in Sioux Lookout. 10 for God's Lake in Thompson, 11 in Norway House. 14 for Winnipeg, 12 in Dauphin. 14 in Regina, 13 for Saskatoon. 10 in Meadow Lake, six with a chance of snow in Buffalo Narrows. In Northern Alberta, sunny and a high of eight in high level, 12 for Grand Prairie. Cloudy and seven in Edmonton, snow and two for Lethbridge. 11 in showers in Vancouver, 16 in Kamloops. 10 for Prince George, four in Dease Lake. Minus two in Old Crow, plus four for Whitehorse. Two above in Yellowknife, six in Wrigley. Minus 10 in Saks Harbor, four below for Politech. Minus eight in Snow in Chesterfield, nine with flurries in Baker Lake. Minus 21 in Resolute, 10 below in Joe Haven. It's been a huge year for Indigenous filmmakers and actors, and the honors have kept coming this week at the Australian Film Critics Circle Awards with Ivan Sen's critically acclaimed movie Limbo taking out six of the nine categories. NITV's Ricky Kirby has more. Shot entirely in black and white on location around Coober Pedy, Limbo is a moody film noir piece about a detective played by Simon Baker, called in to investigate a 20-year-old cold case murder. Where were you when Charlotte disappeared? I got set up. When NITV interviewed director and cinematographer Ivan Sen last year, he explained what he hoped to achieve with the movie. This time I wanted to, to, to make a story where the, the, the two worlds is actually um, there present um, between the, the justice system and, and the, vic the indigenous victims of crime and uh, showing the, uh, the injustice that um, a lot of indigenous uh, families and communities have faced uh, ever since colonisation really. Those aims appear to have been realised with Limbo taking out Best Film and Sen winning Best Director and Best Cinematography at the Film Critics Circle Awards. But that was just the start. Natasha Wanganeen won Best Supporting Actress, Rob Collins Best Supporting Actor, while Simon Baker took home the coveted Best Actor Award for his lead role. What do these symbols mean? Their family. Sister, brother, mother. Limbo is currently being showcased at the Australian International Screen Forum in New York. Ricky Kirby, NITV News. Well, could you survive in the wild by yourself? Living off just your wits and bush skills? I could not. That's the challenge for contestants in the popular survival series Alone Australia, which is back for its second season. And this year, there will be three First Nations competitors among the 10 dropped off alone to battle the elements in isolated areas of New Zealand's South Island. Here again is Ricky Kirby. The red carpet is a far cry from the extreme and wild terrain of Aotearoa's Te Waipunamu. I'm under no illusion that it'll be easy. 10 Australians challenged to brave the elements for their chance to win $250,000. Among them, Defence Force Combat Engineer Chase, Youth Worker Jason and World Heritage Aboriginal Programs Officer Leanne. First Nations survivalists bringing their own skill sets to face the ultimate test of survival. And I've been hunting and fishing for most of my life. Um, yeah, that, that definitely is something that you need to take into an experience like this. Um, 
still doesn't really prepare you though. You, you know, it's a very, um, it's a very different animal. A lifetime of living outdoors and trying to trying to live a, a sort of more of a prehistoric lifestyle, I guess so, and trying to fit into the modern world. Uh, I just like my um, my old old school skills, whether that be my blacksmithing and woodworking. I like doing things uh, from a medieval perspective. With just 10 carefully selected survival items and the natural resources at hand, they will be pushed to the limit, challenged by the merciless forces of nature, hunger and loneliness. It was tough. Um, yeah, certainly different than anything I'd experienced before. Um, yeah, very wet, very cold. Um, yeah, very different to anything I've sort of seen or experienced in Australia. The hills were twice as big, the forest was twice as dense, it was twice as wet, I was, I was alone. With only three ways to exit, voluntary tap out, medical extraction, or as the winner, who will be the last one standing? Alone Australia returns next Wednesday on SBS. Ricky Kirby, NITV News. Looks pretty cool. We'll keep you updated if APTN gets the rights for that. That's all the time we have for your Friday edition of the APTN National News. You can find much more over on our website, aptnnews.ca. And never miss a story? You can do that by subscribing to our APTN News YouTube page. I'm Dennis Ward, Marcy McGwitch. Thanks for being with us. Have a great night.